I'd ask uh, unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare recess during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to today's hearing on the international role of the United States Coast Guard. Um, I wear another hat around here as a member of the Intelligence Committee, and I'm keenly aware of the international moves being made by competitor nations to gain influence um, by exploiting opportunities and weak governance under the guise of building mutually beneficial partnerships. Uh, for example, China's Belt and Road Initiative allows them to shape international norms and forcefully assert their global presence through more than a trillion dollars of trade and infrastructure investments. Given the state of our crumbling domestic infrastructure, it is unlikely that the United States is going to match that level of spending on international projects. So instead, we must make strategic investments that allow us to maintain and develop relationships with key partner nations by increasing their capacity improving their maritime domain awareness and enhancing enforcement activities that uphold the rule of law. So I agree with the Commandant of the Coast Guard's assertion uh, characterizing the financial entrapment of vulnerable countries as more than, just a con um, more than just a conservation and sustainability issue, but rather a natural a national security challenge, warning a clear and decisive response from the United States. The Coast Guard has a long-standing history of international involvement and has played a crucial role in every American military conflict since its inception in 1790. While its military service is obvious, uh, the Coast Guard's diverse mission set also makes it distinctively qualified to advance America's global interests and exert international influence. In fact, the Coast Guard's current international presence is focused on non-military capacity building and strategic partnerships. For example, the Coast Guard has bilateral agreements with over 60 partner nations, uniquely leveraging partnerships across domestic and international arenas on a variety of maritime missions, including search and rescue, counter drug, migration, fisheries, uh, and proliferation security initiatives, bringing trusted access, capacity building, and seamlessly operating under Title 10 and 14 authorities. While the Coast Guard's international missions have proven successful, I am keenly aware of the delicate balance that must be struck when allocating resources. Every cutter sent abroad results in one fewer cutter performing drug interdictions or search and rescue missions closer to home. For this reason, we must ensure that the Coast Guard's increasing international role is met with additional resources. It is unacceptable that the Department of Defense fails to fully reimburse the Coast Guard for the direct international assistance it provides. Further, Congress must consider whether current funding levels are sufficient to support the Coast Guard's vast array of missions. Uh, in particular, and I'm interested in uh, what our witnesses have to say on this front, um, I'm, we have to, we have to uh, right-size our resource allocation with respect to emerging responsibilities of the Coast Guard, growing responsibilities, uh, particularly in the Arctic, uh, where, where the race is on for, for, for influence and for position. And I'd be particularly interested in our positioning in that region. But of course, it's not just the Arctic. It would include the South China Sea. It would include nearly every corner of the globe. So I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses uh, on the international role of the Coast Guard, uh, where there should be a larger presence, uh, and the ways in which Congress can best support that mission. I now call on the ranking member, uh, Mr. Gibbs, for any remarks he may make. Thank you, Chairman Maloney, and good morning, Admiral. Uh, the United States Coast Guard has unique authorities, international relationships, and service culture make it a crucial part of our national security system. Many may not know the wide range of capabilities and responsibilities that the Coast Guard has while it defends our homeland and from foreign threats. As the only branch of the armed services with law enforcement authority, it plays a unique role in the nation's international engagement in crucial hotspots from the Persian Gulf to the South China Sea. Most notably, the Coast Guard uses its unique access and capabilities to strengthen partner nation's capabilities, all in support of our national interests. Our national interests. In other words, presence equals influence. Unfortunately, increasing DOD requests for Coast Guard resources places more stress on a limited budget and other critical mission areas. The FY 2020 operations and support budget increased 4.4% from FY 2019. Legislation passed by the House that authorizes a further 6.4% increase in ONS funding for fiscal year 2021 continues to languish in the Senate. Despite this increases in funding, I remain concerned about how these increased demands will affect the Coast Guard's funding needs, especially in light of the increased competition from other nations. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses and how the Coast Guard's international role supports our national interests and how the service will support this work alongside its domestic maritime missions. And you back. Thank the gentleman. I'd now like to welcome uh, our witness for our first panel, 
Uh, today we're joined by Vice Admiral Daniel B. Abel, Deputy, Command, uh, Deputy Commandant for Operations for the United States Coast Guard. Uh, appreciate you being here today, sir, and we look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our witness's full statement will be included in the record. Since your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee would request that you limit your oral testimony to about five minutes. Um, with that, Admiral Abel, uh, you may proceed. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of this subcommittee. It's an honor to discuss the Coast Guard's overseas operations, our work alongside our shipmates with the Department of State, the Department of Defense, and our combatant commanders. And I know you've got my written statement, sir. In 1978, as a high schooler, I knew I wanted to serve our country in uniform. The question was, what uniform? Inside my locker, as a high school senior, was a bumper sticker from the United States Coast Guard. It said, U.S. Coast Guard, small service, big job. Clearly, that bumper sticker was compelling, but also could serve as a title for today's testimony. We are small in numbers, but our impact domestically and internationally for our nation is huge. At all times, we are members of the armed forces. At all times, we are law enforcers. At all times, we are marine regulators, and at all times, we are members of the intel community. And we serve a nation whose economic interest and national security are vastly linked to the sea. At home, we patrol miles and miles of coastlines and in the waterways, save thousands of lives, protect the world's largest exclusive economic zone. But across the globe, we are a highly demanded instrument of international diplomacy, recognized as the U.S. maritime service that's most relatable to partner nations. And these partner nations model their organization after us and their actions as they seek to address universal challenges posed by transnational organized crime, maritime threats, and their sovereign rights. And we're uniquely suited overseas, permanently or expeditionary, to protect our sovereign rights by expanding the borders out, enhancing partner capacity, and disrupting threats far away from our shore. As the chairman noted, we have 60 binational and multinational uh, agreements and roles in international forms unlike any other branch of the armed forces or any other uh, interagency partner. And these trusted partnerships provide unique access and capabilities across the competition continuum vital to our national success. And we're uniquely qualified to operate in ambiguous or gray areas requiring that flexible blend of law enforcement and military, Title 10 and Title 14, we set and enforce the behavior in the maritime domain. Make sure that the rules-based order of nations is maintained. Candidly, we offer white halls for gray times. And as one of the five branches of the armed forces, we are a force multiplier for DOD in their worldwide deployment to execute defense ops and supporting security defense priorities. We never replace DOD or duplicate DOD capabilities. We apply our unique authorities, capabilities, and partnerships to bridge a gap, expanding the nation's military toolbox like no other armed force can. And in great power competition, we offer transparent engagement and partnerships at the professional and personal level. A free and open Indo-PAC is challenged by coercive and antagonistic activities, debt trapping, the economic and subsistence impacts of illegal fishing, transnational crime, and corruption. As a nation, we have direct interest in the Western Pacific as well. Our U.S. territories comprise 1.3 million square miles, or 43% of our EEZ. In my 41 years in this Coast Guard uniform, I have watched our Coast Guard increasingly bridge the gap from the diplomacy of State Department to DOD's lethality through international agreements, partnerships, and presence. The service is well positioned and comfortable operating in that competitive space below the level of armed conflict, providing capabilities and decision space. Your Coast Guard is indeed a small service with a big job. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and on behalf of the men and women who stand the watch right now and their families that wait for a safe return, thank you for your support. I stand by for your questions. Thank the gentleman. We'll now proceed to members' questions. Each member will be recognized for five minutes, uh, and I will begin by recognizing uh, myself. Um, Admiral, can you talk about the role that uh, intelligence uh, plays uh, in the Coast Guard missions? I have a friend who's a senior uh, 
a senior executive at Goldman Sachs. He's made better career choices than I did. And he, um, he likes to say that Goldman Sachs isn't a bank, it's a technology company. Um, and the insight is that all of their functions are being, um, are being translated increasingly into technology challenges. Um, I have a view that most of the missions of the Coast Guard are going to be intelligence missions in the coming years. Can you say a word about that? Well, first of all, um, we pride ourselves on being an intel-driven organization because if you don't know what you're seeking to do and what the adversary is doing, you're, you're pretty much out of luck, particularly on the counter-drug business. When you've got an area of responsibility twice the size of the continent of the United States, it has got to be intel-based. So you have to know the load's moving, where the load's going to. In a broader uh, role with DOD or other agencies, the fact that we are members of the intel community means we are those links that can link military to other agencies, sir. Can you talk about uh, the role that intelligence plays in missions, um, say, in the Arctic or in the South China Sea? Can you also maybe um, specifically mention the, the need for secure communications on Coast Guard vessels? Uh, yes, sir. So um, there's, a, there's a strong draw to the Arctic whether it's 30% uh, of the undiscovered natural gas, 13% of the undiscovered oil, a uh, trillion dollars worth of uh, minerals, um, or uh, just faster transit from Asia to Europe. The Coast Guard needs to be there. Every Coast Guard cutter should be a collector. And with the national security cutters, and we appreciate the support of Congress in fielding those, uh, we've become very accustomed to having some very exquisite... Admiral, would you, excuse me, if I can just interrupt you right there. I know we're going to put uh, those collection and skiff facilities on the polar security yes, cutters and, of course, on the national security cutters. What about the HPCs? The what, see? What about the high-performance cutters? The offshore patrol cutters? Yeah, excuse me, offshore patrol Yes, sir. Um, right now, we're looking at the capability that's best suited for that vessel. Um, we're doing an alternative uh, analysis to see the best way that she can fit the niche we still maintain that those vessels should all be collectors. There's different ways we could do it. We're working with the Navy particularly. They're right now designing what the skiff will be like for FFGX. What would, what would it cost time. to put a skiff on every, on every OPC? Sir? What would it cost to put a skiff on every uh, We're looking at the cost right now. I'm, I'm, I can get the number back to you, but I would say around $25 million per copy, sir. And how many are we talking about? Times what to outfit them all? We talking about 20? Uh, 25 offshore no. patrol cutters at the end of the, the fleet, yes, sir. Right, so a total, a total number of $500 million? But, sir, that's the equipment alone. We need to obviously I understand, but I, but I understand that they're crew. being outfitted for that equipment already. Isn't that right? Sir? Aren't they already being uh, built with the, with the capacity to add that equipment and add those facilities? Sir, the, uh, the threshold requirement is space, weight, and power. Basically, an empty space with uh, T1 drops to then install the gear that we determine is best for the space. So and that's the $25 million. Th Yes, sir. But that's the incremental cost we would need to, to incur to outfit every OPC with a, with a skip. Current estimate, yes, sir, and we're looking at $500 million, at bucks. over 10 years, 8 years? Uh, over, well, that would be the initial cost. the life cost. of the program. Uh, the program, yes, sir, and then recap. Uh, IT recap fairly quickly. Right, what is that, 8 years? What's the, what's the time frame of the program? 8 years, 10 years? To, for to the OPCs? All the OPCs, yeah. Um, the first one gets delivered 2024. Um, we've got to recompete for Vessel 5 and beyond, so I can get back with you on the actual rollout. Right, but I guess my point would be that in a period where we're going to spend eight, eight to ten trillion dollars on defense, um, we're talking about a 500 million dollar expense to put a skiff on every OPC, which would allow um, the kind of collection intelligence-driven activities for all Coast Guard missions in all corners of the globe. Isn't that right? Yes, sir, and and we agree that. Our white hulls can get places gray hulls can't, and we can collect on things that folks read, are suspect when a gray read my mind, and it's a good segue to talk about, uh, talk about the missions in the South China Sea or in Taiwan. What, what are we currently doing, and, and, and how are we resourcing those missions? Yes, sir. Uh, well, this last year, I, I think you know, we, we pretty much committed a, a 1.0, basically a 365 presence of our national security cutter. Two different cutters, they swapped out about mid-year, and they did a number of things over there. Uh, enforce UN security sanctions. They actually ran the Straits of Taiwan to test the Chinese to see how are you going to handle a Coast Guard cutter that's in a different place. Uh, we did the intel collection that I can certainly talk about on a classified level, but we showed China a different face of the United States that they had not seen. What's the last time we did a freedom of navigation exercise in the Arctic? In the Arctic, sir? Um, 
I'll have to get back with you on that one. I mean, we, we send national it's security cutters. Well, it's been a while, isn't it? we are up there in the national security cutters, but we maintain in our own water, sir. What's farthest north? I'm out of time, but what's the farthest north we have a port um, or a facility, a Coast Guard facility in the Arctic? It's south of Bering Strait, is it not? Sir, um, Kodiak is the farthest north we have. Would it make sense to have a port north of the Bering Strait? Right now, the size of the ships that go up there are well supported with a uh, brief stop for, uh, for supplies in, um, in Dutch Harbor. So right, if, if we're there, we would use it. Is it a requirement? No. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Admiral, last week the Commandant was quoted as saying there's about 750 monthly ship calls at our ports on the Pacific side and that passenger uh, vessels have at least 14 days that are, are, haven't been out for sea for 14 days, are, are detained and tested. As the Coast Guard, are you receiving the notices of arrival uh, and, and also are you providing passenger data from the centers from the CDC? Sir, so uh, what we're doing on that is, first of all, we're tracking all global maritime traffic. We're, any given day, we're tracking 3,000 targets. Looking at just cruise lines alone, for the next 10 days, we're talking 76 vessels, around 270,000 passengers and crew. As they make their 96-hour notification, we work with Customs and Border Protection at a vetting center. We vet last five ports of call, the crew composition, the cargo on the vessel, and then if there's anything suspect, we certainly uh, work with CDC. I would also say there is a mandatory requirement if a sea captain has anyone sick on their vessel, crew or passenger, they have got to notify the Coast Guard. If we get one of those notifications, then we work with CDC for the best option. Candidly, you've seen a few times where CDC said, C CDC said the best option is to have the ship anchor offshore and work the case, and that's what we've been doing. So do you think uh, the Coast Guard has enough resources right now? You feel comfortable or position we're in right now? Uh, sir, it's a challenge right now with the cruise industry. I think you know that the, the, the vice president and our uh, secretary were with the cruise industry Saturday down in South Florida, uh, and they've been told to come back with a plan that mitigates the risks that we've been seeing in the cruise industry. How about the container ships, so the cruise on the container ships, how we handle them? Yes, sir. So uh, the proclamation that said that China had to wait 14 days, there was a cutout for uh, sea cruise. And what we've done with them is, first of all, if anyone's sick, we need to be notified, we'll handle that. If no one is symptomatic, if that ship comes in and they just stay with the vessel, turn the ship around and get back underway, which is what the, the ship wants them to do. They don't make money sitting at the pier, off they go. We have not had widespread problems with the, the cargo industry. That $5.6 trillion of, of economic impact is moving with the containers coming. Okay. On resilience, um, both the DOD and the Coast Guard you cite you know, defense rules-based world order, central objective, foreign policy, and um, what the roles of resilience play in the current rules-based order? Resiliency, sir, for? Well, I guess I, I, I go a little farther. Just the Coast Guard's engagement with international military, civilian, and law enforcement partner affects the resilience of our ports and a maritime transportation system. Yes, sir. Uh, well, you, you know, the... The maritime transportation system is, is an endowment that we got from Mother Nature. I mean, it's phenomenal. The deep water ports, the rivers, that's what fuels the $5.4 trillion of commerce. What we do is, with the international inspections you do overseas, we push the threat over there. And if you don't meet the Coast Guard standards, you're going to have a condition of entry, which at times could say you need to anchor out until the Coast Guard visits your vessel. So it pays for those foreign ports to be Coast Guard approved, meet international standards, so when the ships show up, it's quickly moving, and uh, they can turn around and get their cargo and, uh, and make money. I want to move quickly to the, uh, the Great Lakes. Um, my understanding is on the ice-breaking uh, capacity, um, the U.S. has shrunk from uh, down, nine, down to six vessels, and Canadians has shrunk down to two uh, in the last seven years. Um, where are we in, in, in relation with our partnership or agreement with, with the Canadians on ice breaking and uh, are, are, they, are we able to maintain our commitment or are they, are they maintain their commitment to us? What's yes, sir. Uh, so, it, you know, among those that ring the Great Lakes, it, it, it takes a village to keep the lakes going through the wintertime. Yeah. Uh, we've got a number of vessels. The 140s that we're putting through service life extension right now, we're buying them 14 more years. Um, we also have the buoy tenders that do sustainment breaking. If you can uh, break it every couple days, you don't need the big icebreaker. And, of course, we've got the, the Mackinac. We have good cooperative agreement with the Canadians. If we need help, they come else help us. 
and the opposite. Uh, we also do appreciate the money from, uh, from this committee, and we are studying what the future requirements are within the Great Lakes for ice breaking. Do um, U.S. Coast Guard icebreakers we spend more time in the Canadian ports than the Canadian icebreakers spend in the U.S. ports? What's, what's that relationship? Is so I'll get back with you. I, I don't have the statistics on uh, which side of the, the border they're spending their time. Okay. Like I'll yield back. Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Vice Admiral Abel. My community is very interesting. It is both the home of the Port of Long Beach, and the Coast Guard plays an immense role there, and it's also the home of the large Vietnamese expatriate community in Southern California. And so we rely in our district, as does the country, on free and open in, uh, trade in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and uh, my constituents also have a very strong uh, interest in checking China's influence in the South, especially in the, their dominance in the South China Sea and what is going on. And you've addressed this issue now that the Coast Guard is also very involved in these issues and the importance of cultivating relationships with our allies and what you've done. So my question is, given China's considerable ability uh, to project a large presence in this region, and we know that that's what they're doing, and they have that ability, how can we best leverage the Coast Guard's resources uh, to ensure that we're getting our uh, biggest strategic bang for the buck? What are we going to do? How can we leverage your, and do it a better job, knowing the role of China? Yes, sir. Uh, that really is, is part of our authorities, our capabilities, and our partnerships, which, which are different from DOD. And as I mentioned, many of these countries, their navies or their Coast Guard really look like ours. And a simple, you know, national element, an element of national power could be a team of five Coast Guard petty officers that show up at a country that's struggling, to help them maintain their outboard motors, say, this is how we do it in the Coast Guard. Here's some computerized maintenance records. And why don't we get dinner after we get done today working on your boat? And then maybe can we sell you some boats? Can we give you some boats? Can we maintain some boats? That enduring sustainment of military to military, Coast Guard to Coast Guard, those small military training teams go far, as well as a Coast Guard cutter that can pull in. We could do strategic buoys. We could put buoys in a port that maybe is hindered with its amount of trade uh, because they're lacking buoys. Those types of soft power is where you can turn to the United States Coast Guard, and that's the niche that we fill, sir. I want to follow up on that, on these security relationships, and I think that's very positive. But on the, on the flip side of that, that many of these countries in the Asia-Pacific region that face pressure from China are governed by regimes uh, with mixed or even more concerning records on human rights. We're talking about, you know, I mentioned already the Vietnamese expatriate community. Well, there's a real strong concern um, about um, our relationship or their human rights violations and their pressure from China, but yet engaging in the same kinds of, via, of human rights violations that China does. It, so it's very, very difficult to speak out. So my question is, uh, does, does, in dealing with that, does the Coast Guard training and educational programs include training on human rights issues? Because you're out there dealing with the Vietnamese Coast Guard, forming relationships. Well, we have, and while on one hand it's very positive, we have, on the other hand, we have very strong concerns about their human rights issues. So maybe you could explain that to me also. Well, first of all, all our crews are trained. If they see any abuses while they are conducting the training, there are protocols for them to report back. Also, we work Has with- Has that ever happened? Pardon, sir? Um, I can get back with you. I mean, they're, they're key to say, you know, if you see this, this, or this, this is the things you need to do. Also, we work with Department of State to make sure that the partners we're working with are partners we should be working with, to make sure that we're not working with nations that we can't trust or that abuse- uh, their public. It should be the public goes to those we're working with, not away from those we're working with. That would be the goal. Uh, and I would say, too, that internationally, by pushing back on China and the things that they're trying to make new norms, they will continue to push unless we push back. 
So pushing them back on illegal fisheries, poaching in someone else's waters, those are the things that will stop China from their spread across the Pacific. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. Admiral, thank you for being here today. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit, speak a little bit about the Marine Environmental Protection Mission. Uh, and just uh, start, number one, obviously, uh, the Coast Guard needs more resources across the board. Can you discuss a little bit uh, how is budgeting going for the, the, the Marine Environmental Protection Mission? Uh, where are there shortfalls there? Uh, do you need more? Do you need less? Just give me a little bit of an overview on that to begin with. Well, as far as Marine Environmental Protection, I mean, we. We put the onus on the operator to make sure they have the initial supplies to react to a spill or uh, of national significance, anything like that. But we do need to be prepared uh, as a Coast Guard to, to respond if we need to. Um, could we use more resources? Absolutely, uh, to make sure that we're ready at, at the moment's notice. Uh, also, we, we make sure, again, that we inspect their plan, make sure their plan's viable, they have the uh, resources on the short tether that's needed to then respond in a timely fashion as far as their spill response plan, whether a facility or a vessel. So I wanna switch gears a little bit away from spill and emergency response in that way, and thinking a little bit more about the issue of ocean plastics, debris, garbage. Is it documented in Coast Guard logs uh, uh, on these vessels, what they're seeing, um, certainly around the U.S. or internationally, uh, what they come across in the waters in terms of debris in the water? Is that something that's documented within the logs? Sir, I, I don't know of any requirement that we place on them. Um, we are not the lead on marine debris. That's NOAA, and we certainly team with them on, on a lot of activities. We do participate in the International Maritime Organization conventions on what you can throw overboard, what you can't, what you can pump overboard. So in a way, we're there making sure that what leaves a vessel uh, is carefully sanctioned, and it is, is legal or not legal, and folks know what you need to retain on board with incinerators or trash compactors. But to your point, what you, you don't know for a fact that, or, or rather you don't believe that the Coast Guard is documenting what they're seeing as they're navigating around the world in terms I, of... I don't believe there's a requirement for a commanding officer to report such, no, sir. Okay, very good. Thank you. That's the extent of my questions. I appreciate your time today, sir. Mr. Lamb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Admiral, for coming to be with us here today. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the drug threat and the interdiction work that you all are doing. Um, and I know that you emphasized in your testimony uh, the amount of cocaine seized in the last couple years, uh, which is helpful, but in a lot of our country, especially Western Pennsylvania, where I represent uh, opioids, heroin, and, and more so fentanyl now are the bigger threat. Uh, are, you, are your troops interdicting heroin and fentanyl and opioid products at sea as well? So right now, we're not seeing a large maritime vector, but I would say the same organizations and funds could fund the cartels that are running that. So in a way, yes, we are affecting it, is the fact these large transnational criminal organizations, if they're making money on cocaine, we have seen some mixed loads. Uh, we did see some fentanyl that went from, it was Dominican Republic was going to Puerto Rico. We did interdict that. Um, but... Again, the load may be mostly cocaine and maybe some other stuff uh, uh, sp sprinkled in there. But you have seen some uh, mixed amounts. That was kind of not, was not on, on not par with what we've seen on cocaine coming from the maritime vector. Okay. Um, and is it, is it roughly equivalent on the West Coast Pacific as in the Caribbean, or are you seeing more in one area than the other? You're saying the fentanyl, opioid? Oh, uh, no, just overall your interdiction. Oh, cocaine. Work, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, 80% of our work is in the Pacific, the okay. Eastern Pacific, and huge AOR. Um, and, and the way we get after that, candidly, is it's three sides of a triangle. One, you have got to have intel. You have got to know the loads on the water. That gets you in the right zip code. You have to have a maritime patrol aircraft. That gets you the street address, and you need a Coast Guard cutter with a helicopter that can shoot and a small boat that can shoot because they're not going to stop for you. If you can get those three ingredients, the effectiveness of that Coast Guard force package is much higher. And the, the maritime aircraft, you're saying, separate from the helicopter? Is yes, that sir. That would be that a long-range search aircraft. Yeah. Our brothers and sisters from Customs and Border Protection do a phenomenal job. Department of Defense always has an aircraft down there as well. Uh, and sometimes it's a contract aircraft the Department of State pays for. So there's a number of aircraft, but we could use more. Okay. And just shifting gears for a second, um, do you see 
a growing presence for the Coast Guard in Southeast Asia doing some of this kind of direct enforcement against China that you talked about? Um, as far as personnel, do you have any way of forecasting that, you know, in the next five or 10 years, do you see a big growth in kind of permanently stationing Coast Guard members out there? Right now, uh, we don't have any plans to permanently station folks there. The, the beauty of the Maritime Force is, you know, we can adapt year to year with where the business is. Uh, a good example of what we did was we saw an urgent need we sent one of our buoy tenders with a fast response cutter, not two particularly large vessels, and they went island to island and did some nation building. We called it a strategic action group, which the Navy would snicker at. But for those islands, it was huge. The fact that the Coast Guard came in, they did some nation building, they did some law enforcement training, talked about search and rescue, marine environmental response, and they said, we'll be back in a little bit. And that constant you know, uh, uh, episodic visits that you can get from the Coast Guard goes far with these nations. That's good. So when you talk about um, like trying to crack down on Ill illegal fishing by China, are you talking more about training the local nations to do that themselves as opposed to like a Coast Guard cutter going out there and enforcing it, or are you talking about both? The ideal is that the nation enforces their own sovereignty over their own waters. But these nations, there's a reason the Chinese are going after them. They're the most vulnerable. They, they have weak legal authorities. Their forces are not well positioned. But there also are ways, uh, we team North Pacific Guard with the Chinese, the Russians, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Canadians, and the United States. We all work together once a year. And it's a strange collection of people, but we all say we have got to stop this illegal fishing. And when you get a Chinese-owned Panamanian flag transshipment vessel that the fish is already cut and palletized and frozen, and you can't trace it anywhere. There's a reason one in four fish bought in the United States could be illegal because we just don't know. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Gallagher. Excuse me, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Chairman Maloney and Ranking Member Gibbs. And thank you for being here today to discuss the important work that the brave men and women continue to do in the Coast Guard every single day. You've been invaluable to my district in West Virginia performing the dangerous search and rescue missions and saving lives. While the Coast Guard is both visible and present in my district, the important role that you all play in international waters is just as essential. I believe that it's essential that the Coast Guard has the resources to effectively and efficiently continue to perform their military and law enforcement duties here at home as well as abroad. Along with my colleague from southwestern Pennsylvania, I have a couple questions that have to do with drugs. Last year, I asked the Coast Guard Commandant Admiral Schultz about the role that the Coast Guard plays in seizing those illegal drugs in the Gulf of Mexico. Has anything changed in the last year when it comes to stopping the flow of the dangerous illegal drugs that are coming into our communities from the foreign countries? Well, ma'am, we're constantly adapting because the enemy gets a vote. And we find these drug organizations to be highly adaptive. And wherever we put a Coast Guard package, they quickly move. Now flows are going outside the Galapagos. I mean, we're talking 500, 600 miles offshore in small vessels with crew of three open fishing boats. That's why it makes it a challenge to find it. Um, the Caribbean, 20% uh, of the flow, not as much, but a lot of that flow is faster. You can get from um, Central, you know, South America up to Jamaica, Dominican Republic, much faster than these long routes. But the bulk of the flow we're seeing in the Eastern Pacific uh, goes up to Mexico. And the goal is, if we can catch it in bulk, we catch more than every federal agency combined. And we would much rather catch it in tons than police departments trying to find a kilo here or a kilo there on the streets. Much more efficient, much more impactful against those drug organizations when we catch it in bulk. Thank you. Has the Coast Guard seen any changes in the types of dr drugs that you are intercepting? I mentioned earlier that uh, we are seeing sometimes it's a combination load that, that might have something else mixed in it. Uh, but the, the bulk that we're looking at right now in capturing is cocaine. What more can Congress do to ensure that more drugs are stopped from making their way into our country? Well, I mentioned the fact that that, that triangle of things we need. So uh, we need good, robust intelligence, and a lot of that relies on our interagency partners and, candidly, partner nations. Many times it's a partner nation that gives us a critical movement alert, which means drugs are moving, we think it's going there. So more intel, maritime patrol aircraft, 
There's just not enough aircraft to be out there spotting what Intel has indicated. And then finally, the last part of it is offshore presence. 70% of our major cutters are the medium endurance cutters that are my age. They, they were born in the 60s. We have got to recap that. So the goal would be if we can recapitalize that fleet and also the helicopters that serve on the back of them, they're due for replacement as well. All three of those could grow with additional funding. Thank you. Now I'll switch gears. Last week, the Commandant was quoted as saying that there are about 750 monthly ship calls at U.S. ports in the Pacific and that passenger vessels that have been at sea for less than 14 days are being detained at sea until the test period has passed. Is the Coast Guard receiving the data it needs to do its job through the notices of arrival and from the passenger data being provided to the Centers for Disease Control? So we proactively track anyway. So even before we get an advance notice of arrival, which is 96 hours out, we, we tr we've got 3,000 vessels right now that we're tracking where we think they are going. We're already geo-tracking. If it's coming from a country that may become hotter, let's say South Korea, we already know which vessel just came from South Korea. So that's the first line of defense is keep that threat as far away as possible. Then the 96-hour advance notification, uh, we vet the crew, the cargo, the ship's last five ports of call, and then we decide if there's any risk, and, and any ship has to report any sickness on the vessel to us, regardless of if they've been to China or not been to China or a hot country. Then we work with CDC, and we have robust captain of the port authorities, like you mentioned, to have them stay offshore if we need to. On the cargo side, we have not seen substantial risk. Those ships come in. We restrict the crew to whatever it takes on the pier to turn the ship around. Put the lines over, get the cargo loaded, get back to sea, and they're happy with that because that's how they make money. So we have not seen a huge threat vector uh, disease-wise from cargo. Thank you. I yield back my time. The gentleman, Ms. Plaskett. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Um, the information you provide is really invaluable to us as we uh, work on the needs of the Coast Guard. One of the things you had talked about, and I noticed my colleagues have all brought them up, is the um, interdiction of drugs, and particularly um, in the Caribbean would be my concern. Can you talk about the collaborative efforts or any that you've had with foreign governments, particularly those island nations within the Caribbean, in combating this? Yes, Congressman, thanks for the question. So um, through the bilateral and multinational agreements we have with almost all of those islands, uh, as our patrols come across a vessel, if they claim I'm a Jamaican vessel, that is not a hindrance to us because we have an agreement with Jamaica and we say, would you mind if we board your boat and look for safety and security violations? Jamaica's fine with that. If we stumble across drugs, then obviously it's a whole different story. So number one, we don't let the nationality of the vessel, even if it's fabricated, to slow us down because we have those relationships. The other thing we can do, too, is build the capacity of those partner nations. Mm. Meet them where they are. Could be just forming their own Coast Guard is where they need to be. Could be a few small vessels is what they need. Outboard maintenance. Maybe some rule of law training with Department of Justice to find how you work a case package. Maybe building their own maritime academy so they can teach their own. The goal is let them patrol their waters and quell this as, as a team project in the Caribbean. So the mutual assistance programs that you have are probably really working well at this time. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. And would you say of uh, the other federal agencies that are operating within the Caribbean, how, what is your role and where do you see yourself? Are you, would you think you're leading the charge in terms of how this is done or are you working collaboratively? Are there other agencies you think that may be better suited to take the charge in this? There's a number of different task forces that do pull people together in various parts of their career. Like Caribbean. I know Haida is one. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma and there's, there's a couple that are international as well. I will say that um, we, the status we have, it's, it's almost like the secret sauce we have is people like working with the U.S. Coast Guard. So we can pull together DEA or Department of Treasury or Department of Justice folks, FBI, with their peers in partner nations and make those connections. Um, you're doing an amazing job with what resources you have. And we know that the Coast Guard is a resource-strapped agency. Um, that does come at a cost. The work that you're doing internationally comes at a cost domestically. 
<coughs> in seeing that trade-off, is it important for Congress to consider whether this is an aspect that warrants additional resources because so much of your work is handling internationally in terms of your domestic front? Well, um, particularly the work that we do for DOD, it, it's interesting that the President's National Security Presidential uh, a directive or memo number one was rebuild the military mm -hmm. and the fact that we do not get our funding through DOD DOD has seen about a 12% increase recently we've held two and a half to three percent in operating funds inflation's about 1.9 percent in essence flat for operating funds so we certainly could use some relief we certainly like the new assets we're getting at the capital acquisition account but certainly operating funds would help the Coast Guard. And also, any given day, 2,000 Coasties, 11 ships, five helicopters, a port security unit are all working for DOD. About $340 million is what we get for that work. We give a billion dollars worth of work to DOD. Last time that was adjusted was 2002. So when you talk about the operating expenses, would that also include your equipment? Is that in there as well? Uh, yes and no, ma'am. Uh, if, if it's maintenance of the equipment, you know, you got to buy spare parts, right. that would be operating funds. If it's buying new cutters, that's the acquisition side. And candidly, as we limp old cutters along, mm -hmm. that sucks operating money for spare parts that we should be putting into the new acquisitions. And so in the acquisition, you talked about the, the basic flat line of the operational expenses. What about your acquisition expenses? Have those increased proportional to the Department of Defense? or are they still lagging behind? I can get you more data. I, I don't have a comparison of DOD acquisition to Coast Guard acquisition. I will say that we get peaks and valleys. Um, certainly we appreciate the generosity of the Congress as far as national security cutters, offshore patrol cutters, the fact we stepped up on no, that. No, don't appreciate because I need you to have more, particularly in my area. We would rather you have more cutters. I mean, you're, they're doing a great job with the fast boats that they have, but that's absolutely insufficient for the speed at which some of these drug boats and, um, you know, human trafficking going on in the Caribbean. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Uh, Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral, I want to follow up on uh, a line of questioning from the ranking member and turn our attention to an underappreciated international role of the Coast Guard that people sometimes forget is international, which is the Great Lakes. Across the lakes, you're in Canada, it's a foreign country, they say things differently there. Um, and just as there is a national security rationale for new icebreakers in the Arctic, there is a national security rationale for the Great Lakes as well. Nearly all of the iron ore used in the American steel industry comes from Minnesota and Michigan and ships on the Great Lakes. And lack of adequate icebreaking causes iron ore shipments to be stuck in port instead of getting to steel mills driving up pricing and making American steel less viable in a free market. In the 2018-2019 winter season alone, inadequate ice breaking cost the region the equivalent of 860 shiploads of iron ore. And so I know we touched on this a little bit, but just to foot stomp it, when you're making vessel acquisition requests of Congress, how does the Coast Guard factor the importance of Great Lakes ice breaking and connect it to national security? So we've set up a separate um, acquisition office that's looking at the unique icebreaking capabilities of the Great Lakes, which are different than what the North Pole and the South Pole require, sir. So we're looking at what's there. As I mentioned, it's a collection of assets that break on, on, the, uh, on the lakes. Uh, the buoy tenders, the 140s, our Canadian partners, as well as the Mackinac that's there. So all of those work together. We're taking a look at the trends of the industry. Fully agree with you. Um, that trade is vital to the economic interest of our nation. The economic interest of our nation is the security of our nation. And then I was pleased to see the FY21 request includes a polar security cutter, which I agree is important. Does the Coast Guard intend to request a new Great Lakes icebreaker, just so I understand this, after Congress, Congress has adequately funded the new polar icebreaker? So I don't, I don't think we can say one or the other. Yeah. Right now we're looking at the requirements for what the Great Lakes require. I think once we get requirements scoped, then we'll look at where we drop it in based on the age of the Mackinac and what the requirements are. But we certainly appreciate the fact that ice, the Polar Security Breaker number one is paid for, number two is in the, um, the 2021 budget. And then to, I want to follow up on uh, switching topics on a question that Mr. Mast asked 
uh, and I didn't fully understand the response. Doesn't the Coast Guard have responsibility for the implementation of MARPOL, Annex 5 specifically, and our, the legislation we have to implement it, the act to prevent pollution from ships with respect to plastic pollution from ships? Absolutely, sir. And when our marine inspectors go aboard and we do boardings, we find out how do you handle your overboard discharge, whether it's solids, whether it's liquid, all of that is inspected. The question was, if we see something plastic in the water, do we report it? The answer is no, sir. But certainly, we make sure internationally, vessels are living to the international standards for the benefit of the whole globe. And then to switch topics yet again, uh, on the Hask uh, side, when we talk to the Navy, we're having this very interesting debate about the role that unmanned ships are gonna play in the future fleet. Now, I know there are different equities, Navy, Coast Guard, but theoretically, unmanned surface vessels open up similar opportunities for the Coast Guard as they do for the Navy. Can you talk a little bit about how the Coast Guard is thinking about unmanned technology? So we've, we've pushed the envelope a little bit. I know we've done some unmanned aerial systems up in the Arctic doing search and rescue using thermals because it's easier to find a, a body uh, you know, in, in the, uh, the cold Arctic. We have every national security cutter has an uh, unmanned system on the back of that. We've awarded the national contract. Uh, every one of those will get a UAS that is running whenever they're underway. Huge game changer for on-scene presence, persistent presence in the drug fight. But we're finding those systems are used across the missions of the Coast Guard. Um, but what about, sorry, the, the, you're talking about unmanned aerial systems, yes, sir. right? Any unmanned... We're, we're looking at some of those candidly. I don't think we'd be the lead on that. Yeah. You mentioned the Navy. We're really interested in what their research and development comes up with. We have an R&D center up in Groton, Connecticut that works with their peers in DOD to find out who's got the best of the best so that we can then work off of that to apply it to the Coast Guard. I have 15 seconds. Are you able to retain the cyber talent you need in the Coast Guard? No, sir. And we're looking to actually grow the cyber talent in the Coast Guard. Thank you for a succinct response. I yield the remaining four seconds. Uh, thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral Abel, thank you for your service. Thank you for being here today. Coast Guard, uh, you execute a lot of missions, a lot of uh, diverse uh, missions from drug interdiction, search and rescue, ICE operations, law enforcement, and you are also a very valuable partner to the DOD, particularly the Department of the Navy. In response to Representative Plaskett's question, uh, you mentioned that uh, you provide roughly $1 billion of defense readiness mission. $1 billion? Yeah, $1 billion, and are reimbursed $340 million. That is of great concern to me, and I think it's of great concern uh, to members uh, of this uh, committee. Um, we invest a great deal uh, in defense. I sit on the House Armed Services Committee, um, and the annual increase in defense is probably multiples more than your total budget. Um, I want to just give you an opportunity perhaps to uh, flesh out a little bit more your response to, to Representative Plaskett. Can you talk about what resources the Coast Guard is dedicating towards this defense readiness mission and at, ex and at the expense of, of what non-defense readiness missions or the other missions that you're asked to execute? Well, first of all, sir, it's a trade-off. Um, we've, we've got work we do on behalf of Department of Defense. We have work we do on behalf of Department of Homeland Security and the Coast Guard on our own. Um, every single year, um, we work with Department of Defense. They do requests for resources, just like any other branch of the armed services. They come to us and say, we would like X, Y, and Z. Can you provide it? We balance that with our domestic missions. Uh, to see what we can afford to do as a resource uh, constraint. We do the best to optimize that mix right there. The one thing we try to do with DOD is we try to make sure that whatever they're asking for is unique within the Coast Guard, not just another large hull. It should be a large hull that because it's white, it provides this. The capability we bring is this. The legal authorities are different. To make sure that if we do commit a resource to a combatant commander, it is unique to the Coast Guard, and we're the ones that can fill that niche. Now, with the um, publication about two or three years ago under the current administration of the most recent national defense strategy as we sort of um, you know, turn our attention to refocus again on great power competition, 
um, uh, Russia and China, have you, how has that impacted the trend line in terms of the requests for you to execute defense readiness missions? Well, if you look at the spectrum of you know, competition to conflict, we're much more over towards the competition side. And that's a good role for the Coast Guard. Like I mentioned, small vessels, frequent visits. These countries are going to make choices of who the partner choice is. We would like that to be the United States. So if we can play that role for DOD, we have the large ships. We can plug and play. We are interoperable with the Navy and the Marines. There's no question we could do that if time of war comes. But our role really is more towards the, compete, the uh, cooperation and the compete side instead of the conflict side. Let me ask it this way. Um, Again, today you, you uh, testified one, bill, one billion of services, 340 million reimbursement, you know, roughly 760 delta million. What was the delta four years ago? So I can get that number back for you. Like I said, the last time the 340 million that we get reimbursed was adjusted, it was 2002. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's my concern. I, I believe the delta is actually growing. You're becoming a, a, a bill payer for a very important uh, mission, defense readiness, uh, but it's my understanding from previous hearings before this committee uh, that, and perhaps you, you have this uh, uh, data and you can either correct me or confirm, uh, that the Coast Guard has got about a $2 billion backlog. Uh, is that about accurate? Uh, that, that would be on shore facilities alone, sir. Yeah, sure. That's without even talking helicopters and airplanes and ships. Um, every Coast Guard mission starts from the shore, and it is crumbling, and that includes housing for our families, that includes the command centers, the, the piers they come into. Um, we, we need to recap the shore side, and I would also say C5I. Everything's connected with a spinal cord, which is IT. We've got to invest in that as well. And perhaps it's an oversimplification, but you know, rough, rough numbers back of the envelope. If you were fully reimbursed in about two, less than three years, you could meet all of your, back, your facilities backlog requirements. Uh, so that's of just concern to me, I think, members of the committee, and I really hope that we can address that uh, in the combination work that we're doing on this committee and the House Armed Services Committee, and I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman, and uh, that concludes the members' questions. Um, we have a second panel today, so I'm going to thank uh, Vice Admiral Abel and, uh, and ask that we move to our Second panel, thank you, sir, for being here. We appreciate your service and all you do. Yeah, do I have to just do any mumbo jumbo before that? All right, I'd like to welcome our uh, next panel. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we're joined by Ambassador David Balton, Senior Fellow for the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center, um, Dr. Stephen E. Flynn, Founding Director of the Global Resilience Institute at Northwest, uh, excuse me, Northeastern University, and Dr. Amy E. Seawright, Senior Advisor and Director of the Southeast Asian Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Appreciate you all being here today. We look forward to your testimony. 
Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Um, and as the previous panel, uh, as with the previous panel, since your written testimony has been made part of that record, we ask that you limit your oral testimony to uh, approximately five minutes. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Balton, you may proceed. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, I spent 32 years at the Department of State. I worked very closely with the Coast Guard. Much of what I'll tell you this morning is based on those experiences. We face considerable challenges relating to the oceans, challenges the United States cannot solve on its own. We need to engage other nations, international institutions, other actors. We also need to make best use of the assets at our disposal. The Coast Guard is one such asset. I know from personal experience that the Coast Guard can and does engage successfully at the international level on a wide range of ocean issues. We should put this capability to even better use, particularly with nations with whom we have difficult relationships. For example, the United States and Russia both border the Bering Sea, home to valuable stocks of fish. Both nations harvest those fish. At the moment, the United States and Russia have difficulty working together in many settings. This is not a new phenomenon. For many years, when I led the U.S. side in annual fisheries meetings with Russia, the bilateral relationship problems eroded trust and made our work difficult. The Coast Guard, through its ability to work with its counterparts in the Russian Federal Border Service, often provided the best available means of maintaining needed cooperation in challenging times. The Coast Guard has developed a professional and dependable working relationship with Russia, a relationship that has survived intact for the most part even now. Thanks to that, we have seen very few incidents in the past two decades in which Russian trawlers have crossed the maritime boundary line to fish illegally in U.S. waters. Indeed, with support of the Coast Guard and other law enforcement agencies in the United States, we were able to sign a bilateral agreement with Russia in 2015 to combat illegal fishing. The Coast Guard also worked successfully with China. Yes, with China. As long ago as 1993, the Coast Guard entered, entered into a formal arrangement with China on joint fisheries enforcement operations based on a memorandum of understanding. That MOU allowed Chinese fisheries enforcement officials to ride aboard U.S. Coast Guard cutters operating in the North Pacific Ocean. If a cutter came upon a Chinese fishing vessel on the high seas fishing illegally, for example, using a large-scale drift net, the Chinese official could take law enforcement action against the Chinese vessel using the platform of the U.S. cutter. Due in part to initiatives such as this, large-scale drift net fishing in the North Pacific Ocean has subsided, and the need for that MOU has accordingly diminished. I understand that the Coast Guard and their Chinese counterparts are now considering a more comprehensive agreement to promote joint efforts. In the Arctic, the Coast Guard has played a large role and could play an even larger one. Coast Guard leads efforts to implement the 2011 Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement, the 2013 Oil Marine, Marine Oil Pollution Agreement. Both of these treaties commit the Arctic states to work together in responding to problems that are rising in greater number because of increasing human activity in the Arctic Ocean. As came up earlier, the Coast Guard also leads our participation in the International Maritime Organization, was instrumental in developing the 2017 Polar Code, a set of rules designed to strengthen safety and environmental security in the Arctic. 2018, the IMO also approved a proposal developed by the Coast Guard with Russia to manage increasing vessel traffic in the Bering Strait. These are examples that show how the Coast Guard can advance our nation's interest in a safe and secure Arctic Ocean. That said, all signs point to the need to expand this capacity as the Arctic Ocean grows more accessible and the need to protect U.S. interests there also increases. The Caribbean region presents a final illustration of the Coast Guard's capacity to carry out multiple missions in di difficult diplomatic environments. The Coast Guard has responsibility for dealing with migrants who are trying to enter the United States illegally by sea. Over many years, I saw the Coast Guard perform admirably in rescuing people attempting perilous ocean journeys and vessels of dubious integrity. The mission required Coast Guard officers to understand and implement the nuances of changing U.S. immigration and refugee policies. Coast Guard can also help us address growing concerns about oil pollution in the Caribbean, including from Cuba. Given the proxim 
Proximity of the United States and Cuba, a major oil spill in the waters of either country, could have serious consequences for the other. In the past decade, the Coast Guard has helped to improve communication and oil spill preparedness and response with our Caribbean neighbors, including Cuba. Once again, we'll need more of this in the future. I urge a subcommittee to support efforts of the Coast Guard in the international sphere. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Bolton. Uh, Dr. Flynn. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Maloney and Ranking Member Gibbs. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. This is, uh, turns out to be my 30th time that I've appeared as an expert witness before a House or Senate hearing since the attacks of September 11, 2001. In virtually all those hearings, I've testified about how we manage transnational threats that have animated the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. And certainly, the transnational threats remain clear and present as the current global outbreak of COVID-19 is highlighting. At the outset, I just want to say that I think the Coast Guard is the nation's most under-leveraged and most underinvested national security, foreign policy, economic policy, and homeland security asset. We talk sometimes about trade-offs between the Coast Guard's domestic capabilities and resources versus its foreign policy or its international role. The real questions about trade-offs should be between what other instruments we use to advance national security goals, homeland security goals, economic security goals, and foreign policy goals. We highlighted already the discussion about the amount of benefit the Department of Defense gets from leveraging the Coast Guard, or the intelligence community can get from the Coast Guard, and yet the investments are nowhere equal. And so it's so, I think, critical for the debate about investment in the Coast Guard be put in the larger context of those key policy goals of America, and we are under leveraging and under investing in the Coast Guard. My testimony provides a bit of a sort of a tour de force about why the Coast Guard's role is so critical in advancing the homeland security and national security and foreign policy goals all at the same time. I particularly want to just sort of drive home a, a couple of points that I tried to make. It's very clear that when we're dealing with transnational risk, they don't pay much attention to borders. And so our organization of national security as water's edge out and domestic security as border in doesn't work so well when you're trying to deal with things particularly like coronavirus, but also organized crime, other nefarious things that are working in a transnational realm. And so this ability that the Coast Guard has to be able to operate in the international, in the space in between, in the maritime realm, and ultimately in the domestic is important. But it's the relationships that the Coast Guard has built at the state, local, federal level, with territories, with the means to be able to interact with their foreign counterparts overseas. It's the relationships with the private sector in the global maritime industry that its authorities and its capabilities provide. There is no other national asset that we have that can essentially move across jurisdictions, move across functions. As Admiral Abel laid out at the outset, it is a armed forces, it's an armed force, rather, it is a law enforcement agency, it's a humanitarian agency, and it's a regulatory agency. Find something else in the U.S. government that is all of that. And in the effort of undertaking those missions, women and men of the Coast Guard know they can't get any of it done without working well with others. And so it's one of the unique national assets we have that plays well with others, that actually collaborates and cooperates. So when we look at what we ask it to do and the resources we provide it, that delta is just, frankly, reckless and negligent on the part, I think, of the American people. They're not getting the benefit they could. In Congress, I urge, and the administration, I urge, to make the investment that the service could provide. I want to also sort of provide particular emphasis on the Caribbean and the Arctic region. As we know, China is making a significant investment in the Caribbean. And the U.S. investment has gone down significantly, and that's especially true of the Defense Department's presence in the Caribbean. The Caribbean is, of course, still remains a challenging area from transnational crime. But when we look at what's happened with Venezuela and the migrants that have flown out of Venezuela and the ability for the islands to absorb that, let's also imagine what's likely to happen when the cruise industry essentially goes dark and COVID-19 shows up on the Caribbean islands 
an, a region where 40% of the island's GDP is tied to tourism, what the kind of disruption that will be. And it turns out the singular agency that actually has operational presence across the Caribbean is the United States Coast Guard. And it also deals with this crazy thing that we have in the Caribbean, which is, of course, that Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands as territories are viewed as a domestic uh, entity and often not included in our Caribbean-based efforts and strategy. But again, the Coast Guard straddles those two worlds, so it's able to essentially manage and have a Caribbean-wide approach. And in the terms of the Arctic, while the Department of Defense has now woken up a bit and realizes that is a strategic area to play, they really can't play up there. And the Coast Guard has the presence, has the authorities, has the relationships with most of the Arctic nations. We should be investing in the Coast Guard. I make a final uh, 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 pitch here about managing the transnational risk of terrorism in the global trade and transportation system has to be done in a global way. And again, the Coast Guard has unique authorities, unique reach, but especially its relationships and ability to work with the global maritime industry is so critical to getting us ahead of those challenges. And we have still, again, underinvested in that effort. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flynn. Dr. Seward. Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs. I'm sorry, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Gibbs, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my testimony will focus on the U.S. Coast Guard cooperation with Southeast Asia littoral nations, which face tremendous challenges in the maritime domain. And because of this, uh, they, they represent a real strategic opportunity for Coast Guard cooperation. The strategic importance of Southeast Asia to the United States is often underappreciated. Southeast Asia lies at the heart of the Indo-Pacific, with vital sea lanes flowing right through it, including the South China Sea, where one-third of global shipping passes, the Malacca Straits, which is one of the most crowded uh, waterways in the world, as well as, the, as well as the Sulu Sea, which is a hotbed of transnational crime and terrorism. Aside from its geostrategic location, the region provides critical ballast for a rules-based order through its regional organization, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, which has led the creation of a security and um, economic architecture um, uh, that convenes the major powers and provides some rules of the road for good behavior. ASEAN norm setting and ASEAN-led regional dialogues provide somewhat of a bulwark against China's growing assertiveness in the region. Because of Southeast Asia, Asia's pivotal geostrategic role in the Indo-Pacific, it has become the fulcrum of emerging U.S.-China strategic competition, and yet U.S. engagement with countries in the region does not always match their strategic significance. A fully integrated and well-resourced Indo-Pacific strategy for the United States would place a high priority on maritime cooperation with the littoral states of Southeast Asia to help them address the serious challenges they face in the maritime domain. These challenges include, first and foremost, protecting their sovereignty and their ability to monitor maritime activities, access natural resources, and protect the marine environment within their territorial waters and EEZs, all of which are under growing threat from China's increasing maritime assertiveness. Vietnam, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia in particular have seen growing Chinese encroachment into their territorial waters and around disputed maritime, maritime claims as China seeks to aggressively assert its expansive claims under its nine-dash line. China relies heavily on its Coast Guard along with its paramilitary maritime militia to project power and assert its claims through gray zone tactics that seek to blur the line between civilian and military forces and engage in course of actions while remaining under the threshold of military response. China has been rapidly expanding and modernizing its Coast Guard, uh, and today um, the Chinese Coast Guard is the world's largest, boasting more hulls in its fleet than all of the regional neighbors combined. Chinese Coast Guard ships have played a lead role in several recent gray zone skirmishes in Southeast Asia, including the political row sparked by the incursion of several uh, Chinese Coast Guard cutters es escorting Chinese fish fishing vessels into Indonesia's EEZ off the coast of uh, Natuna Islands in December, and the standoff between Vietnam and China over the Vanguard Bank, and recent harassment of Malaysia's uh, oil and gas exploration activities in waters on its extended continental shelf. 
These episodes demonstrate the new normal in the South China Sea in which new energy development by Southeast Asian states anywhere within the Nine Dash Line will be met by persistent intimidation from Chinese law enforcement and paramilitary vessels. Chinese maritime coercion in the South China Sea grabs most of the headlines, but the countries in the region face a number of other maritime related challenges that are very high on their political agendas. And at the top of the list is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, IUU, which causes huge economic losses to these countries. There's other sorts of transnational crime from wildlife and human trafficking to narcotics and piracy that are also very important uh, and, and real problems in the territorial waters of these countries. And the, 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 this region suffers, from, uh, dis, suffers disproportionately from large-scale maritime natural disasters which uh, the typhoons and cyclones in the region are only intensifying and growing more frequent with climate change. And so disaster response capabilities are also at the top of their list. Faced with the growing challenges of Chinese maritime assertiveness and other threats in the maritime domain, Southeast Asian countries have been doing a lot recently to build up their coast guards. Um, and I go in my written testimony into some detail about the various steps that these countries have taken. And in seeking to boost their case gu Coast Guard capabilities, the U.S. Coast Guard is a partner of choice. Indeed, the U.S. Coast Guard has played an important role in helping Southeast Asian Coast Guards build capabilities through a variety of capacity building programs, training and educational opportunities, and equipment transfers, in particular for the countries of the Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Uh, and I do go into some detail, again, in my written testimony about the various ways that, uh, that the Coast Guard has assisted the, the Coast Guards of these countries. Um, of all the tools in the U.S. Foreign Policy Toolkit, the U.S. Coast Guard is perhaps the most valuable and yet underutilized in cooperation with Southeast Asia. The U.S. Coast Guard is uniquely positioned to engage with Southeast Asian counterparts and advance U.S. national security interests for several reasons. First and foremost, Chinese threats to these countries' maritime sovereignty is the largest security challenge that they face, which has led them to really seek the ex expansion and deployment of their Coast Guards to counter Chinese gray zone tactics. And as these countries increasingly rely on their Coast Guards, U.S. Coast Guard engagement and capacity building with these partners is incredibly valuable. Because the United States does not take sides in maritime disputes with different claimants, American diplomatic efforts, as well as military options to deal with Chinese maritime co coercion are to some degree limited. The U.S. Navy conducting frequent and regularized fawn ops to challenge excessive claims of China and other states is a very useful tool to underscore the U.S. commitment to freedom of navigation. However, fawn ops alone are not a sufficient strategy as a strategy to deal to help these countries counter Chinese maritime aggression because it does not directly address the immediate challenges they face in terms of coercion against fishing, oil exploration, and other lawful activities within their waters. Dr. Searight, if I could ask you to yes. wrap up your prepared remarks so we can move to members' questions, and then be happy to give you a chance to elaborate on that, in particular in my own. But if you have any concluding remarks, feel free to, uh, feel free to conclude. No, I would just reiterate that I think, um, you know, there are various reasons why the U.S. Coast Guard is uniquely valuable as a tool of engagement with the, these countries on a core, core issues of importance to them. And so I think it's, it's really important to consider the Coast Guard in light of a, an effective Indo-Pacific strategy. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, we'll now move to members' questions for five members each, uh, begin by recognizing myself. Let's just pick up right there, Dr. Searight. So, um, would you say a word, please, about what we should be doing in Southeast Asia, the South China Sea that we're not? And if you could say in particular a word about Vietnam, uh, specifically the Vanguard Bank, and also uh, the Philippines. And with respect to the Philippines, I'm curious about the role the Coast Guard can play in an era. Um, obviously, we understand the importance of the island formations and, and the Spratly Islands and the rest, but, but also with respect to the different perception President Duterte has of the Coast Guard versus, say, the rest of the United States military? Yeah, the Philippines is an excellent example because under Duterte, of course, he has sought warmer ties with China and he has downplayed uh, a conflict with China, various tensions in the South China Sea. 
And he has also, of course, sought some distance between the United States and our military alliance. But he really favors the Coast Guard, in part because he sees it as a de-escalatory mechanism for dealing with um, you know, various incidents in, in territorial waters. So he has boosted the Coast Guard, and that has offered an opportunity for the US Coast Guard to offer training, both in the Philippines and educational opportunities here in the United States. There's been a, a, you know, a number of, of articles, that have, of excess defense articles, equipment that have been provided to the Philippines, uh, et cetera. So in terms of your, your, the broader question, though, what can the United States do in the South China Sea? I mean, our options are limited because you know, we do not take a position. The United States does not take a position on, on the claims, the various claimants. Um, and the, really, the, you know, whereas the, the Navy uh, conducting FONOPs and doing various naval engagements is certainly important to boost the capabilities of these partner countries, these countries are relying more and more on Coast Guards to counter the White Halls of China. And so that the best, really, I think the best tool that we have in our toolkit is to help them build up Coast Guard capabilities and make them into professionalized, well-equipped, and well-trained forces that can, that can project presence uh, and, and deal with a variety of challenges on the maritime domain. And that would be equally true with respect to our growing relationship with Vietnam and situations like the Vanguard Bank, is that right? Yes, absolutely. And when it comes to Vietnam, Vietnam, there's still a lot of sensitivity about uh, too much military cooperation with the United States. They're concerned about um, China's reaction to doing too much too soon. The Coast Guard soon. provides an opportunity. And the Coast Guard is a less sensitive area. Appreciate because, that, but yeah. because I have limited time, let me, let me turn to you, Dr. Flynn. So let's just go up to 30,000 feet. So let's say we were going to properly resource the United States Coast Guard. Um, so let's say we lived in a world. Just this morning we've heard about $2 billion. We know about that in the backlog of shoreside infrastructure. We know about $700 million annually of uh, unreimbursed expenses uh, from DOD. Um, what does a fully resourced Coast Guard look like in your view? And, and, and if you could be specific, uh, that would be great in terms of where you would add additional resources. Right. The great strength. I mean, we, we're spending about $11 billion, just to calibrate people, we're spending about $11 billion now. It's about 1.5% of U.S. military expenditures and a $700 billion budget. Uh, pretty big bang for the buck, uh, bunch of statutory missions. What should that budget be? What should we resource it at? Um, if you could help us with that, please. We should be working towards doubling. Uh, Over what period of time? Next decade. Doubling in a decade. In a decade, yes. And where would you put that additional 11 billion? <laughs> well, it, it really. Are you including? Are you including the backlog of shoreside infrastructure in that, and the under reimbursements, or is that in addition to that? Yeah. Well, you can, I haven't. I'm you not get, gonna, to, you yeah, get the I'm seven billion if you just if you just reimburse, feet. right? So I would say yes, double. You got to clean the backlog up here, but it really is across the service's missions. It's this multi-mission capability relationships, again, it has at the domestic, international, law enforcement. So, so you, you don't want to do this as a pick a just pointy end of the sword piece of it or just in a particular geography. It's the overall capacity of the service that creates such a powerful national asset. And it's why the service has such good standing and strong standing with other countries because it deals with the full range of challenges, whether it's in the Caribbean or in Southeast Asia. But as we certainly look to the Arctic, just the need to invest into at least three icebreakers, the needs we talked about on the Great Lakes, that of further icebreaking capability, right. you know, again, from economic policy and all the rest of it here, those are the terms we should be talking about, not in five, seven percents. And overall, it's minuscule from the kinds of resources we've been willing to invest in our national security capabilities and certainly in our intelligence capabilities. We just haven't been putting the Coast Guard in that mix. I appreciate that, sir, and I couldn't agree more. And just by one data point that I think people might find useful, uh, Russia currently has 46 ice-breaking vessels, I believe, with 12 more on the way. Uh, the United States Coast Guard has two, one, one large and one medium-sized with uh, a handful on the way. Uh, Russia, just to calibrate people, has an economy the size of the state of New York. It's approximately $1 trillion GDP. We're a $20 trillion economy. Um, and, and it is shocking given the emerging opportunities and challenges and national security uh, threats from the Arctic that we don't properly resource that mission. But I take your point about the, the underinvestment in uh, I believe you said the most under-leveraged and under-invested uh, uh, asset we have. Um, and 
I really appreciate your testimony on that. A lot of us like to work on that issue. Uh, Mr. Gibbs. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Flynn, after 9-11, the United States and much of the world updated its support uh, security infrastructure and the framework under which that security infrastructure was regulated. There was discussion at the time of whether those updates and initiatives were focused too narrowly on responses to terrorist attacks or whether they met the broader resiliency uh, need of reports and supply chain that depend, depends on those ports. It appears that the coronavirus response might pressure that the system. Do you believe that the current port safety and security regimes in the United States provide a level of resiliency necessary to protect our ports and the supply chains that rely on the ports against the spread of coronavirus? No. <laughs> I kind of figured you might say that. Um, you know, it's just amazing the conversation we're having here. And when I, when I think, think we're, we're asking the Coast Guard uh, mission what to do. We have them off the coast of Africa. We have them in the South China Sea. We have them in the Arctic and, the, of course, the Caribbean and in both our, the Great Lakes and also, of course, the, our, our, our ports uh, on the east and west coasts, coast. And, and uh, you know, your discussion just now about how much money it would take, you know, it, it just amazes me. But, um, uh, you know, the relationship that the Coast Guard has with DOD, uh, what's, how do you see that? Um, is it strained or is it a, work, a good working relationship or is it, uh, you know, the Coast Guard's, you know, is treated like the, uh, you know, the second child or I don't know how you want to say it. <laughs> I, I think if you talk Except to child. anyone in the operational there part of our armed services. Sorry, sorry, I missed you that. Yeah. If, there's, if you talk to anyone in the operational part of the armed services, they're overwhelming fans of the Coast Guard if they know the Coast Guard. It's the budget people that are a little bit of a challenge. Okay. And, um, and, and they're very good at hanging on to resources for DOD, not so good at spreading the, um, uh, the, the resources when they're getting capability out of the Coast Guard. But just how disconnected this is, you know, we spend more money on protecting the port of San Diego than all the other commercial West Coast ports combined because it's force protection. And it's a rounding error for DOD to say, all right, we've got to step up our port security. But for LA, Long Beach, Oakland, San Francisco, Richmond, Seattle, Tacoma, we spend less on port security for those ports than we are Combined. spending Combined. in Singapore. Yeah, and, and then further, we deploy the Coast Guard to do force protection for the fleet from LA, Long Beach, to San Diego to escort it in and out. Now, DOD is getting an important service. That's a vital national security interest for us for it to be able to project power. But again, as a trade-off, we're trading off investing in our own security and then the capacity of the service to be able to be out in front of something like the coronavirus and managing with Merchant Marine and all the kind of capabilities there that require. You're always robbing Pe Peter to pay Paul in the Coast Guard when in fact the need for it is, is being well recognized operationally. It's not being well re recognized by, as resources. And I know you, you, in your testimony you referred to the the Caribbean and also the challenges up in the Arctic. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the Russians are eating our lunch up there, and I, I assume the Chinese are trying to do the same. Uh, and we don't even have a port close to the Bering Strait, right? No, it's in, in the needs of the investment in the Coast Guard to provide that presence is an order of magnitude less than it often takes to get for DOD assets, and you get all this other multi mission capability as well. And you got an agency that's used to dealing with the domestic, so the state of Alaska, which has very good relations with many of the local communities because there are Coast Guard women and men who are living in those communities. And they were relationships with all the uh, Arctic nations, Canada and well, Sweden and so forth. And so you leverage that, and yet we're looking at the money as national security is entirely separate from homeland security. And when we look at homeland security, we're overwhelmingly looking at the border and the Coast Guard just sort of falls away our, as a as our, our it is. international agreements in the Arctic up with Canada. Um, what, what's that situation, the status with Canada, with our working relationship? Does Canada have enough capacity to, to, to make up some of this deficit? Or, or there is, I think, a real willingness on the part of the Canadian government to work very closely with the U.S. Coast Guard on additional Arctic presence. You know, as we know, we have freedom of navigation issues and other stuff there, but done in a collaborative way to engage, both recognize our country and there is recognized the Chinese and the Russian particularly presence presents a real challenge to the security, economic security, as well as both countries. 
So there's opportunity. But we have to bring some resources to the party. The Canadians are making an investment with a much smaller GDP than ours, and you know, they should. They're a true Arctic nation. But we are as well. Alaska is a big chunk of the Arctic. And our sea lanes, whether they come from Trans-Pacific, trans Atlantic, come great circle routes right through the Arctic Ocean, as essentially the Chinese and Russia have more presence there. It's, ex it's extraordinary that the Department of Defense has not woken up and taken that on as a higher national security priority. I'm glad to bring it to the surface. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank the gentleman. And uh, just to put some gloss on that point, it's interesting to note that the closest point China has to the Arctic is 900 nautical miles, and yet they have a, they have a more aggressive presence in the region than we do. Uh, Mr. Larson. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. I apologize I wasn't here for the Coast Guard uh, portion. Uh, I will be submitting comments, uh, questions for the record for the, to the Coast Guard. <clears throat> um, uh, is it Dr. or Ms. C. Wright? Mrs. Dr. C. Wright? Yeah. Um, I had questions for you, but you answered them. They were along the lines of the unique capability the Coast Guard has in Southeast Asia that's different, say, from our U.S. Navy, and I think you answered that um, adequately for me. That's fine. I do have a question for um, Dr. Flynn uh, and uh, Mr. Bolton, Ambassador Bolton. Is that right? Yeah. I can't see that far anymore. So, um, uh, bigger print on the name tags. Uh, the issue of U.S. Canada. So, um, my my concern. I have a lot of concerns. One is about the Arctic, but um, we share a water border with Canada in Washington State. So, with, with British Columbia and U.S. Canada. So, questions I have are really less maybe strategic and more about that particular relationship, especially as it impacts the um, management of the waters as that impacts the southern resident killer whales. So Canada has a, has a uh, I forget what they call it, like a whale, a whale plan um, to deal with uh, uh, ensuring shipping doesn't interfere as best it can with uh, migratory routes of the southern resident killer whale. Um, uh, introducing increased uh, regulations in the event of increased oil uh, transport through the Salish Sea, through the Gulf Islands and, and outside of the San Juan Islands. And um, I'm wondering what kind of cooperation can we and should we expect the U.S. to provide uh, Canada to, so that we're co-managing across the boundary as opposed to just relying upon Canada to, to manage that um, uh, manage that set of issues. Flynn. I think the, the, the key, I think, with our relationship with the Canadians in the Pacific Northwest, as it is uh, in the Atlantic as well and along the Great Lakes, is a willingness to share. Uh, and, and so if they have some extra capacity, um, we can leverage some of theirs, and if we have some extra ca capacity on the, our side of the border here, we can play those. And so we we'll, I think, to look at it portfolio versus purely one-on-one. -on -one. An area there I think there is real need and opportunity. But I think the Coast Guard working with this Canadian counterparts can be quite helpful. It's an area with concern that I have is when we have the major Cascadia quake, the impacts on the port of Vancouver and on uh, Seattle, Tacoma, and potentially, depending on how the quake works, all the way down into Oregon, uh, you need close cross-border collaboration for managing if what, what assets you have, where can you direct resources. So things like Jones Act and a whole series of other sort of challenging issues that could evolve when you're trying to respond and recover are things that require good planning and engagement in advance. And if you find issues where you have real common interests, like the recovery post a major earthquake, where if there's going to have to be shared assets across the Cascadia region, then some of the issues where there's real tension, perhaps, because you know, we're not quite in alignment on some of the ways we look at whaling or other things, you, you can start to get some movement in those areas. So, so again, I think a unique strength of the Coast Guard is it can look at that through that sort of comprehensive lens, not just as a single agency looking at it purely as an environmental issue or purely as a security or law enforcement issue. You bring all the issues in play, and you usually get the best outcome. And so. Um, but more work needs to be done in planning for uh, that inevitable uh, disruption, what it will do to the port infrastructure. You know, the Northwest really is an island infrastructure from most of the rest of the nation's critical infrastructure. It's true of Southern California as well. And so the sea is where you're going to be able to, to manage your response and recovery. 
And uh, we've got to think through very carefully how we have all the capacity we can and, and do it in the context of our, our Canadian neighbor as well. Yeah, Ambassador Walton. Congressman, the question you're asking is not really about the Coast Guard, though. If your concern is cooperating with Canada to protect marine mammals or to manage shared fisheries in the Northwest, we're talking mostly NOAA, some Department of State. I worked in that space a lot. Uh, but I would echo what um, Dr. Flynn was saying. There is a high degree of cooperation uh, on both coasts with Canada. There is a willingness to share, including sharing data. Um, so I think uh, you couldn't ask for a better neighbor in that one respect, yeah. Sin, um, who's best equipped here to answer um, any, uh, sorry, um, well, uh, answer my next question on the second round as we come up uh, on my time. Thank you. <laughs> I'll yield back. <laughs> I thank the gentleman. That completes the first round. Uh, I have no questions at this time, and neither does the, uh, the ranking member, so uh, you may continue, uh, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Additional Mr. five minutes. <clears throat> yeah, it might be, uh, again, getting back to some of the testimony, or some of the written testimony about the Bering uh, Sea and North Pacific um, and IUU. Uh, what, uh, the, the, test, the written testimony comes across a little bit too much like everything's great, um, but uh, in talking with uh, the fisheries folks in my state, uh, the, there is a little more, maybe perhaps a little more conflict between the U.S. and Russia than reflected in, in the testimony. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, what more needs to be done on, um, on IUU when it comes to the fisheries in the North Pacific and Bering Seas. Yeah. Oops. Um, excuse me, Congressman, I'm really sorry. <clears throat> the chair didn't remind everyone to turn their phones off. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> My bad. Um, not, everything, not everything is wonderful. The, uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Russia has problems even in the fisheries space. That said, in the Bering Sea, it's in the interest of both countries to prevent illegal fishing. And there is a fairly high degree of cooperation, even now, thanks largely to the Coast Guard uh, in the Bering Sea. We don't have a lot of fishing vessels coming over from the Russian side to fish illegally in U.S. waters. That used to happen in the, in the mid-'90s. Uh, it has not happened very much since thanks largely to the Coast Guard. There's also some better sharing of science, and frankly, the Russian science on fisheries is, has gotten better in the last generation. I've seen that as well. Um, the Russians fish all over the world, though, and uh, are not necessarily a force for good. They, um, they don't police their vessels the way we do, especially far from home. And as fisheries start moving north of the Bering Strait into the Arctic Ocean, I worry about the sustainability issues there and our ability to cooperate with Russia on those. You say as uh, fisheries begin to move north because of the warming water? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Dr. Flynn, anything to add? Do you have anything to add? Dr. Flynn? Sorry. I, I really don't. I don't think I have real expertise to, to lend All to right. that. All right. Dr. C. Wright? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Um, seeing no further questions from the members, uh, I'd thank each of the witnesses for your testimony here today. Uh, we really do uh, appreciate your appearance, and it's uh, been very helpful to the committee in its work. I'd ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as the witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may have been submitted to them in writing, and further ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments or information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objections to order. If no other members have anything to add, uh, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>